Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast with Trent and Leighton Kling. Coming up today, more Amazon news, a large credit card-based settlement, and we get more holiday shopping forecasts. Pouring in. We'll also discuss earnings with AutoZone to lead off the show. Please rate us and subscribe to the Retail Focus Podcast wherever you listen weekly. We see your ratings, we love them, and keep them coming. If you have story ideas or questions, our email is retailpodcast at gmail.com. This week we're brought to you by productsup.io forward slash campaign guide and AdRoll.com, the easy-to-use e-commerce growth platform. Well, as I mentioned, we lead with AutoZone. They surprised analysts in a positive way, at least with earnings, as they announced their fourth quarter earnings this week. And on the earnings call, that came alongside a big announcement the company's been working towards for a long time now. Let's quickly remember their third quarter earnings that saw them beat on earnings but came up short on revenue projections. Revenues only increased last quarter by a modest 1.6%, but operational efficiency, lower inventory costs, and continued share buybacks all helped out the coveted earnings per share number and guess what more of the same this quarter a very similar story in terms of both revenue and earnings yeah if you look at this quarter's financial results you can see that there are trent a lot of similarities between the third quarter and fourth quarter this fourth quarter it wasn't all that bad though for autozone even though they were sort of the same ho-hum numbers revenue missed ever so slightly coming in at 3.56 billion dollars but Looking back over 2017, this means that revenues did increase 1.4%, albeit a modest number. But overall, you see that operationally with their stores here in the United States, those same store sales rose 2.2%. So they're operating at a pretty good pace. Earnings per share beat yet again as the company's internal goals of improving operations and stocking their stores with the right merchandise throughout the right season has paid off for them. Adjusted earnings per share hit $18.54 per share, beating Zach's consensus estimates of $17.88. This is almost a 20% increase over the $15.18 they brought in this time last year. For reference, Trent, it's always important to put things in perspective. Two out of the last four quarters they beat on Wall Street expectations for earnings per share. Those share buybacks that you know, have been really a staple of AutoZone and a lot of other companies that have been churning out cash. They feel as though placing that capital in share buybacks is the right thing to do. That contributed this quarter to a stronger bottom line number. And honestly, this is just, again, something they've been doing quarter after quarter. AutoZone repurchased 974,000 shares in the fourth quarter worth about $665 million. Gap earnings per share did decline 1.6% thanks to some non-recurring costs that included terminating their pension plans. We'll talk about that here in just one second. Gross profit did increase for AutoZone, but so did operating expenses. Operating expenses as a percentage of sales increased 37% or to 37% rather from 32.6% a year ago. This again, resulted from the termination of pension plans and domestic store payroll. And you look at those wages, they've been rising more than ever, rising more than the rather modest increases we saw this time last year. An example of this is in the employment cost index, which is a a measure that a lot of retail companies look at, a lot of companies overall look at, to see how wages overall in the United States are increasing. That index was up 2.8% for the second quarter, the biggest increase since the third quarter of 2008. So for over 10 years now, that's the biggest increase we've seen, and it's affecting a lot of retailers, a lot of the companies we talk about on this podcast, seeing the cost of payroll going up. Now let's get to the earnings call where CEO Bill Rhodes was fairly straight to the point as he typically is on these earnings calls, but he was also optimistic. He noted that a hard winter last year ended up resulting in car issues down the line into this year's fourth quarter for AutoZone. And again, their quarterly set just a little bit offset from most retailers. But 
They said eventually led to sales in many markets, including the Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, and the Midwest. But as for things potentially bringing down or mitigating sales, good weather generally out west was to blame. So we hear the weather excuse on both ends of things in this circumstance, particularly in terms of comp sales. Good weather was blamed on the west coast. As we all remember, the rain last year that apparently hurt cars, so the idea there going against tougher comps in terms of those sales driven by weather. Higher fuel prices were also talked about briefly. Management likes to see lower fuel prices generally because there's a correlation they're seeing between the cost of a gallon of gasoline and how many miles get driven. Makes sense. The more miles, the more maintenance long term, the more you're going to be visiting your neighborhood AutoZone, O'Reilly's, or Advanced Auto Parts. Overall, they did see a lot of areas where internally they could have improved on in the quarter that were in their control. Affecting the bottom line was all of the promotional activity surrounding ship to home. Ship to home for AutoZone at least, they see is really an opportunity for the customer to have a product delivered that is not in their local market. So instead of their local store getting a part delivered with a normal freight delivery, customers had the option of having it sent to their home free of charge. And while it was not the same day shipping that we're seeing a lot of retailers roll out, this was a cost that has eroded gross margins in general. And Leighton, I know you experienced this. I think you ordered a $100 part recently that probably cost AutoZone $8 to ship, and that eroded a large percentage of their margin, and they alluded to that erosion in this earnings call. But they did increase their total amount of stores, which included units in their small but growing international presence. AutoZone upped its store count by 78 stores in the quarter and relocated another four. Generally, they've been bullish on new development, even if it means rezoning some areas entirely. In addition to the 78 domestic openings, they opened 32 stores internationally. So they have an astounding 562 stores in Mexico now and another 20 in Brazil. Now, currently, those are their only international markets, but there's still markets that management likes and management likes the trends in those two particular markets and sees potential new store growth in both. They also added three mega hub stores, and we'll get into mega hubs a little bit more here in just a moment. And those hub stores, the mega hub stores, will be used for the forecoming next day delivery services as well as supplying conventional locations in those markets. Basically, the hub stores are stores in these markets that carry a larger amount of inventory, supply other stores in that same market with that larger inventory. So if a customer orders a very special item or an item that might be a little bit more rare, those hub stores can actually service them rather than the distribution centers. They noted that the mega hub stores in particular accounted for more same store sales in the immediate regions that they served Makes sense. Less waiting apparently equates to less people walking away to a competitor, whether it's online or a nearby O'Reilly. Overall, AutoZone now has 6,202 stores globally. They do have locations in all 50 states. Breaking down their U.S. locations, a grand majority of their U.S. locations are in 47 states in particular. So they have over 5,000 of their locations in those 47 states. And finally, one last note from the earnings call before Leighton breaks into the next day delivery program they unveiled. They noted their largest sales growth in their commercial sales program since the first quarter of 2016, which is about two and a half years for them. Their commercial sales program, again, you're looking more business to business here. This is occurring despite the fact that they opened fewer than 150 new commercial accounts since last year's fourth quarter. Rhodes noted on the call, a lot of the growth is organic. Existing customers are placing more orders and they're placing orders more often, thus leading to overall growth that for them was nearly 9%, far outpacing their direct-to-consumer growth in this circumstance. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about what we alluded to at the beginning of the story, which is the next day delivery program. This is something that AutoZone has been piloting for some time in a select few regions around the United States and has now officially opened up to the majority of the United States per a company press release that, again, is alongside their earnings release on their investor relations page. You can check that out if you go to AutoZone's website. But this program is intended for more common parts. Not all of their product portfolio is going to be listed in this next day delivery program. It makes sense. Some parts are specialty parts. 
some parts are uncommon and hard to source. So absolutely, it makes sense that these parts should be readily available, the more common parts in the local distribution hubs or stores normally. So they're looking at the parts they carry every day in their common stores here. Over the past year or so, they've been working on creating those larger store mega hubs that we had just talked about in certain areas of the country, specifically to implement programs just like this. They now have, by the way, 24 mega hub stores overall they will have over 100,000 items so i mentioned that they're common items didn't realize that a hundred thousand items are common to autozone they carry a lot of products every day in their stores and these 100,000 items that are going to be available for next day delivery should be available in a fairly short window and here let me explain what i mean by this the time cut off for next day delivery is fairly liberal it seems to coincide actually more or less with their store hours of operation so many stores throughout the united states and trent i just got done traveling to california and colorado if you check out our instagram you'd be able to see those pictures but overall you see that AutoZone in those two markets close around 9 p.m or 10 p.m so customers if they are in those markets, can actually go up and order an eligible part for next day delivery up to the hours of closing. So up to around 10 p.m., customers can go in and get the part the very next day. Now, we talk about customer convenience. That is exactly what that is. Being able to order something and get it just hours later is extremely convenient. In fact, that's exactly what Amazon's whole business plan right now from the retail side is predicated upon, having that optionality even though it costs maybe a little bit more for the company, that customer experience, that customer know-how, that they can go in, order something, and get it extremely quickly if they have an important project, if they need to get to work the next day and have their car running, it's very important. And just like with the limitation on the number of different parts available, like those common parts, those 100,000 parts, location accessibility will Again, this is a downside, be somewhat limited. The focus is going to be on roughly 80% of the entire U.S. population or around the 83 larger markets that they currently do business in and have some of those stores as hubs. There have been prominent retail insiders that have actually declared that while companies have done the right thing, just like AutoZone here with this story, in better delivery and online functionality, rural markets will actually be left out of the picture, leaving many customers in the dark and while this may be the case for same day delivery services just like this in this space smaller hard to get to markets are actually being targeted by the likes of napa auto parts just to name one the cost of convenience is extremely high when serving maybe a single customer that is out in a rural market 45 minutes away from a distribution hub so for a single part it may cost 20 dollars in fuel alone so that's something you have to factor in when you're talking about serving just 80 percent of the u.s that 20 percent is extremely costly extremely expensive to get to in the press release again the company points out that they are differentiated by their physical store footprint the fact that they have more stores than o'reilly auto parts is extremely important the fact that they've been building out consistently quarter after quarter new stores relocating stores very important for them their steady expansion of their stores quarter after quarter even though same store sales are representative of a company that maybe doesn't require a whole lot more in terms of sales floor space, this is very important for them in terms of logistics, being able to strategically coordinate between residential areas. And again, that ties in with exactly what they've been doing as far as relocating stores. Maybe they're only moving a mile down the road, but maybe that mile down the road means they will be able to better facilitate that same day delivery service that they're touting now in their conference call to analysts the word combination parts coverage i put quotations around parts coverage came up a lot this is a direct tie-in to serving more people in the united states no matter where or how spread out they are on the map so long term they are focused on serving 100 percent of the population not just the current 80 percent that they've been able to achieve up to this point at the end of it all their customer-focused supply chain has led to big expenditures. However, they're not holding back anytime soon. They told shareholders and analysts on the call that the cost of IT expansion, while high, is going to continue in the years to come. And while they do expect slow adoption of many of the convenience-based services like we're talking about with next-day delivery, 
which is natural. They do see a large payoff in the end. And marketing departments, by the way, are also hard at work trying to relay the message to their core customer of that differentiated service offering, not just having a larger product portfolio that they've had for years, but being able to actually bring those products to your home in a timely fashion. Now, shares of AutoZone after all of this, ticker AZO, fell over 5% after the earnings release on Tuesday. This despite actually beating on earnings, as we mentioned. But the market seemed to think that their lack of beating on revenue in this circumstance was warranting the fall. They went from $747 per share on Monday to $710 per share on Tuesday. However, they ended trading on Thursday at $761, which represents a quick two-day turnaround, even though Thursday saw the Dow up over 200 points. Now, because of quarter two and quarter three, AutoZone has had a bit of an up and down year. All-time highs in January of $800 seem to indicate a range that would be short-lived, but some say to expect new all-time highs with their well-timed IT and mega hub investments. This is really a company where it depends on what color glasses you're looking at them through. Some analysts seem to be very bullish on AutoZone, others not as much. And oh, by the way, for the record, a company called AutoWeb has taken the A-U-T-O ticker symbol. They are a digital marketing company that helps car dealers promote their inventory and services. So if you went to look at AutoZone under A-U-T-O, not there. Instead, A-Z-O is what you're looking at in terms of AutoZone. I got this phone call about 5.30, 6 a.m., was tasked with devising a go-to-market strategy for a rebrand. We knew that we had resonated with those hikers or those surfers or skiers, but we needed to expand our reach and make sure that these people were able to go from the boardroom to the board with our sunglasses. AdRoll was definitely instrumental in getting this new brand out there, both from a prospecting and remarketing standpoint. And they kind of helped me break down how the funnel looked and how we wanted to position our messaging. I was getting slacks from everyone in the company when they'd see an ad somewhere and like in the New York Times, everyone was super stoked to see our new content and our new brand uh, creative out there. You know, they definitely helped me shine internally at Sunski from a marketing standpoint. To find out how Sunski and 37,000 other brands grow their businesses with AdRoll, visit adroll.com slash retail. That's A-D-R-O-L-L dot com slash retail. Well, Amazon was in the news again this week with their potential plans to expand to, into brick and mortar on an increasing basis over the next three years. And of course, as with any time, Amazon tosses out information like this, even through anonymous sources, as was the case this week. This had a bit of a negative impact on stocks of Walmart and Kroger, although not as severely as in the past, like with the Whole Foods acquisition. Leighton and I have gotten very used to seeing these stories about Amazon blow up, despite the fact that we've talked about on the podcast, you have to take these things with a massive grain of salt because many times we don't see their plans pan out just like these pie in the sky stories claim that they will. And this week, when we talk about pie in the sky, we'll break down kind of what this would mean for Amazon in terms of this week's stories, in terms of growth in brick and mortar. Now, this news comes as Patrick Waldron was recently assigned as the head of real estate for Amazon. Waldron was most recently the VP of real estate and development for Save-A-Lot Food Stores, and before that was at Lidl for over three years as their director and then VP of real estate in the U.S., although we should go back and note that right now Lidl's dealing with real estate and real estate developers in the U.S. has hit a bit of a rocky patch with some lawsuits and the like. This grocery experience for Waldron, based on what Amazon is rolling out and his new development knowledge, ties in well with what Amazon would need as they grow out into new and unfamiliar territories. And while news of this brick-and-mortar expansion, or supposed brick-and-mortar expansion, we should mention that this was not an official release by the company, but rather a story quoting anonymous sources. This news seemed to take many by surprise. You know, honestly, we weren't taken aback. Jeff Bezos, for 20 years, has openly told reporters that they've always wanted a fairly large brick-and-mortar presence, but only when they felt like they could truly have a different store model than everyone else, and they feel like they've got it at this point. 
it has taken a while. Again, over 20 years, just like Trent just mentioned. But I think Jeff Bezos, I think the senior leadership team really does see a clear path to being able to have a sustainable brick and mortar presence throughout the United States. It's funny because Whole Foods, they were actually criticized by some, even though some had praised that acquisition not too long ago. A lot of people criticized them because they said Whole Foods really isn't that differentiated. So why would you buy that if you said for the last 18, 19 years that you wanted a brick and mortar presence that is truly different than what's out there already with the likes of Target, with the likes of Kroger, with the likes of Walmart? But when asked about that, Jeff Bezos actually responded and said that, yeah, there are some conventional parts of Whole Foods. However, they have a founder leader in John Mackey that was passionate about the type of product that they sold and that the model really stood out in terms of sustainable foods and their product sourcing versus the likes of other grocers. So he has a point there, even though Whole Foods... They did have a lot of problems, especially the last three years as a publicly traded company. They had a ton of problems. Quarter after quarter, same store sales started to fall. But Bezos went on to say that they have really not even substantially started with the prime initiatives for Whole Foods yet. So everything that you've seen as far as the new signage, all of the promotional activity in store, he's really indicating that the merging between the two is still ongoing. But with Whole Foods, Amazon Go, and Amazon Books, those three brick and mortar concepts that they have going on, it seems as though Amazon Go is going to be the one that they're going to most rapidly expand, or at least supposedly rapidly expand. Amazon Go is, of course, the cashierless concept that took a little bit longer than expected to complete in Seattle. This is a story that we've been following since its inception. So, we followed it at the beginning of construction. We followed it throughout the different iterations of the software. And we followed it when it was finally open to other people besides Amazon employees. Originally a bandwidth and software problem, the issue seemed to have been ironed out such that the proof of concept is there and the system is much more reliable. At least we haven't heard of any downsides from their current system. Amazon has several patents, by the way, surrounding the technology that tracks customers' items as they meander the convenience store size footprint. So far, between three stores in the Seattle metropolitan area, between 1,400 and 2,000 square feet. And even though this is another big retail story that is centered around Amazon, because Amazon dominates the headlines, it was actually refreshing for us this week because our Twitter feed didn't have a lot of big retail news. A lot of the big news outlets, the big news categories over the past couple of weeks have sort of lacked any big news for us to cover or talk about on the podcast. And Trent, on Thursday, bold headlines proclaim that Amazon was taking over with Amazon Go with plans for thousands more stores in the United States. You know, it's funny because at this time last year, many people were saying, well, oh, physical retail is dead, particularly where it comes to you know your traditional going to a store, picking up an item. But when Amazon does it, it turns out to be the greatest idea ever to have groceries inside something that resembles a conventional, tangible storefront, almost like a 7-Eleven in an urban area. Now, we should mention with those three current Seattle locations, Amazon is first looking to add more in Washington, where they're arguably more familiar, not only since their headquarters is there, but they also have more experience with the processes in Seattle currently. Now, Bloomberg suggested that unnamed sources close to the matter stated that the number of new Amazon locations could be 3,000 by the year 2021. Others, perhaps not so close to the senior executive team, have given a number that closely resembles 2,000 rather than 3,000. Either way, this is a massive expansion of a concept that, while Leighton mentioned we haven't heard a lot negative from those three stores, we need to remember it's still just three stores. If it were anyone else saying we're going to expand from three stores to 3,000 within the span of three years, everyone's eyebrows would be raised and brows would be furrowed. And I don't know that you would see such market bullishness as what you see with Amazon Go. I think one thing to drive home too in terms of the news coverage is that Amazon, they're not likely to be taking all that much market share from Kroger over the next few years unless they can do it through their online specific platforms rather than these particular brick and mortar stores. Because again, we're talking a store footprint of 1,400 to 2,000 square feet, a lot of ready to eat food. I think the C-Store industry is probably more worried about Amazon taking over in terms of that 
than Kroger should be because, let's face it, 1,400 to 2,000 square feet, you just don't have room for the selection there like you would do in a conventional store. Anyway, regardless, in order to have either number of stores, either 2,000 or 3,000 in such a short amount of time, it would take massive teams of people on the real estate side to canvas areas. We absolutely have to put this into context and into perspective. Casey's General Store, let's look at them. They were founded nearly 60 years ago. They have 2,000 locations in the Midwest. They've been focused more on ready-to-eat foods, like these Amazon locations have been, which brings us to privately held Quick Trip, who has also implemented a strategy of larger footprints and a backdrop that features a kitchen. They have expanded very carefully themselves, studying every intersection of a given market for years before expanding or relocating, and they have almost 800 stores, and are also 60 years old. So here we're talking about Amazon potentially being as large as two massive C-store chains that have a lot of ready-to-eat foods there. And at the same time, they're doing so within just the span of a couple of years, where oftentimes it might take in the C-store industry a couple of years just to research particular locations. And we're talking about real estate acquisition, buying 2,000 or 3,000 spaces for anything in the U.S. within the span of two or three years can be a difficult proposition. And while these convenience store examples that I just used are indeed direct competition in this circumstance for Amazon, Amazon doesn't seem to want to be in the business of fuel, which helps out certainly, or many general merchandise items at its stores. So therefore, they're not going to necessarily need massive corner lots to operate, just a densely populated area with a few parking spaces, and that's pretty much it. Areas that would otherwise be devoted to general merchandise can be used for fresh produce, which most convenience stores do have so little of, although that is beginning to change as we're seeing more convenience stores jump into fresh produce. Either way, even though the fact that you're not looking for corner plots on which to plunk gas stations, you're still looking for two to 3,000 real estate locations. And online and media outlets started doing just simple arithmetic to show how opening thousands of stores in just a few years could stress Amazon. They would have to open 19 stores a week starting right now in order to have 3,000 total locations by October of 2021, you would need a massive real estate team to get something like that done. And some analysts late, and they're saying anything over a thousand between now and the end of 2021 is basically impossible. I honestly don't see how they could have any more than 500 in the next three years. However, I am not on the senior leadership team, and you have to put it into context again. These are smaller locations. It's not like we're going to be building out larger 120,000 square foot Walmart super centers anytime soon. But the math does make bigger growth opportunities seem somewhat unreasonable. We have to remember, however, Amazon's corporate methodology, or at least what they claim to be their timetables for these high level decisions. So here we are talking about something that has potentially leaked to major news sources. We're talking about Bloomberg, Forbes, etc. They hear these big rumors. They hear of an insider talking about 3000 stores. They think that this is most likely going to be a concrete plan, but You have to take a step back and you have to look at how Amazon operates day to day and to see how they operate even on earnings calls. I'll give you an example. When congratulated on a particular quarter, even this last year when congratulated on a particular quarter, Jeff Bezos, he responds by saying that in any given positive quarter, the end result, the positive result that they experienced really had three years of work going into it three years of planning and thoughtful discussion at the highest level to get to that point, meaning that they've already been planning to get where they are. They're a forward thinking company that is looking forward five, 10 years, not quarter to quarter or month to month. So in this particular case, they may very well have a solidified blueprint of where to go and when with a rigid timetable and where to open these particular Amazon Go locations. However, with them just now appointing a new head of real estate, as Trent just mentioned, it seems unlikely that a strategic maturation has been borne out because we talk about three, four, five years down the line. If they had talked about this strategy three, four, five years ago, they would have already probably had a head of real estate and everybody else on the team would have been hired. And if you look, if you do a little bit of research, you can see that they are hiring new directors for real estate, meaning that they are probably now in that phase of looking ahead three, four, five years 
in to then grow out 3,000 stores maybe in seven or eight years. Regardless, for now, we have to be realists and trust some of the other more reasonable claims that Amazon is more likely to open just 10 locations in 2018 and maybe just 50 more locations on top of that in 2019. What is most interesting is that even with the sources that are giving the more tepid numbers, they still say the end goal is to have 3,000 locations by the end of 2021. So honestly, Trent, I don't know what to believe at this point because that would mean after 2019, after you've opened 60 stores between 2018 and 2019, you would have to open 122 new stores every single week until September of 2021. That is absolutely crazy. I do not think that's reasonable. If we're talking about reasonable goals, they better get started if they were to hit the 3000 mark by the end of 2021, or at least the fall of 2021, even though the most bullish Amazon fans wouldn't want this. Also, if you look at the pragmatic view, they should be taking their time to feel out markets and take time to feel out the tangible results with the sprinkled out location. So let's say you enter a large metropolitan market like New York City, where there's maybe a CVS on every single quarter, you're not going to go in and be concentrated right off the bat. You're going to go block by block and try to analyze, just like Trent said, Quick Trip does. You want to be able to get familiarized with the different intersections, the levels of traffic, so on and so forth. Regardless, the target markets are at least clear for them. Only the largest metropolitan markets are to be targeted in the short to midterm. And I want to transition now to costs. And we talk about real estate all the time, or at least more so on this podcast. It's really going to be an established urban market setting where they're going to be entering. And that is not cheap. Talk about rents per square foot. They are the highest in these target markets. Even though the locations are smaller, again, between 1,400 and 2,000 square feet per location with smaller parking lots, there is no way around the high cost of entering these markets. We always hear of rents in Manhattan being too much to break even for many. That's why they always have staple stores, more of tourist destinations than a store that does more than break even. This is going to be a major hurdle for Amazon as well as the availability. Some of these mature markets are densely packed as far as retail is concerned with 95% occupancy rate and better, meaning that if Amazon even wanted in, they would have to actually wait for a vacancy. And to be honest, Trent, this is interesting because we hear of that in Seattle. So this is something that they should be aware of. On the flip side, commercial landlords would be wrong not to see the traffic potential and newsworthiness of Amazon Go in their strip center or out parcel. So if they know that they have a vacancy coming up that fits the Amazon Go desire, then perhaps they should look at getting Amazon Go in there despite the lease rates. Maybe they could even cut them a break because they know they're going to get that traffic. They're going to get that positive news headline to drive traffic to all of their other current tenant base. And while coolers and lighting will presumably be newer and efficient with these locations, the in-store networking technology also will not be cheap. People are forgetting that according to Bloomberg, the cost to set up the very first location The first Amazon Go in Seattle was around $1 million. And we hate to be obvious and point out that future iterations of this technology, this networking technology inside the store is going to be much cheaper to install long run. But we do have to factor in eventual upgrades. Upgraded servers, after all, have been proven to weigh down operational efficiency in AWS. Even though AWS is wildly profitable, They do have to write down quarter after quarter server upgrades, and that's something you have to factor in with these stores as well. Also, the amount of power that in-store technology is going to use is presumed to be much more than conventional point-of-sale systems with cashiers in tow. Regardless, this looks like many of Amazon's ventures here, where once there is traction, it may take a long while before the business is actually profitable here with Amazon Go. To summarize here on Amazon Go, once again, we feel like they will expand at some point in time and maybe eventually reach two to 3,000 stores. But realistically, given retail occupancy rates, we've talked about them being so high in so many markets throughout the U.S., they may have to wait on more desirable locations. And more than anything, that may cause a hindrance 
to get them to that overall store account. We feel like the technology may be there for Amazon, but overall, again, as Leighton mentioned, you just brought on a new head of real estate, essentially, in this circumstance. It's not as though this has been in the works for five years and they've been dealing with landlords now for five years to try and negotiate for open spaces coming up. So we do see a runway for growth for Amazon Go in the U.S. Just don't know that it's going to be as aggressive as some of these articles have said during this last week. And remember, Amazon a couple of years ago during the holiday season put out a big thing about how they were going to make drone delivery possible. Well, I haven't seen any drones delivering Amazon packages to my doorstep just yet. So these things do take time. There are regulations that you have to cross. There are, in this case, real estate hurdles that you have to cross. And you're dependent upon other people. I think of Jeff Bezos and his team. If it were just up to them, they might be able to make it to the 2,000 or 3,000 stores. But the reality of it is you need open real estate, especially for this particular store footprint and the store model that they're using. If your business is wondering how you could push sales on Facebook, if you're reaching the right audience on Facebook, or just worried that you're losing track of who you're targeting on Facebook, you know, it's always a problem to find the right audience and address users at any stage of that sales funnel. But what if there were a way to make sure your ads were shown to the right people across different verticals with different creatives? Imagine if you were able to have all your Facebook ads accurate, auto-corrected, and that you can push your entire product catalog with just a few clicks. Stop losing market share. Sell more products to relevant target groups now. All of this is possible. You can push your product feed quickly and easily to Facebook and also take your feed from good to great. Use your marketing's full potential now. Get your complete campaign guide to Facebook dynamic ads. Get ready to master your Facebook ad account and learn to be more performance driven than ever in order to ensure your profitability and business growth. You can download it now on productsup.io forward slash campaign guide. Again, that's productsup.io forward slash campaign guide. Well, tis the season of holiday shopping forecasts coming out, and Deloitte releases theirs amidst a bullish retail landscape overall. Additionally, this week we got data from Compare Cards via Chain Store Age that suggests that men have already gotten an early start to this bullish holiday shopping season. We begin with the Deloitte forecast here. The headline-grabbing number was 5.0% to 5.6%. This is how much Deloitte expects total holiday sales to increase this year over last. So over 5% growth in this circumstance. They predict $1.1 trillion in holiday sales spanning November to January in the U.S. These numbers are seasonally adjusted. They also exclude gas and motor vehicles, which are actually numbers included in the Fed's retail report. So that's the differentiation here. Another attention-getting prediction forecast sales growth of 17 to 22 percent for e-commerce sites now this seems fairly reasonable this is actually in line with increases major retailers have seen year over year on their e-commerce sites and other quarters we talk about businesses like target and walmart having double digit growth in e-commerce so 17 to 22 percent isn't outside the realm of possibility whatsoever seems very reasonable and overall e-commerce sales are projected to make up 11.9 percent of holiday sales which would be up from rest of the year numbers in terms of the overall market share for retail sales if these predictions hold true now let's take a look at why deloitte expects this projected increase to be so large Well, the increase is coming as a result of disposable personal income growth expectations. Deloitte sees disposable income increasing year-over-year 5% to 5.4% and stable personal savings rate, which is a really good thing if you're a consumer. This means that customers may be comfortable spending more at retailers because they have that cushion back in their bank accounts. However, there are some potential headwinds that the firm did note. In particular, they mentioned that the impacts from the Fed continuing to tighten screws on rates potentially being felt in late 2018, this could come a reality for a lot of people. They're spending more on interest rates. If they try to secure a home loan, they're going to be paying a lot more than they would have a year and a half, two years ago. They also know that the potential for the stock market being overvalued, 
Should the market decline, this could pop the consumer sentiment bubble we've been seeing. And that's an interesting dynamic, Trent, because if you think about it, the stock market may very well be overvalued. But if someone's 401k gets hurt in a negative way, that doesn't actually hurt their disposable income. That just hurts their ideas about the economy. So overall, we have seen retail price to earnings ratios generally rise over the last three years as a testament to the increase in overall market valuation. Deloitte said a tertiary impact to any market decline would be a reduction in household wealth, which may especially tighten the wallet for upper income households. However, again, this is money that most customers aren't really touching on a day-to-day -day basis. With 401ks and things of that nature, that is money that's set aside for retirement unless you have an emergency situation in the short term. Not to downplay what Deloitte has produced, but we typically put a bit more stock into the NRS holiday predictions. Their chief economist, Jack Kleinhens, who we've actually had on this podcast, has a remarkable track record when it comes to predicting holiday spending forecasts. And now, about early spending. I wanted to talk a little bit about this study from Compare Cards that found that many men actually have been reported as having completed their holiday shopping list a little bit early this year, much earlier than women. Yeah, in fact, they have a higher chance of shopping early than women by over two times. Now, surprisingly, it's also predicted by Compare Cards that they will spend more money than women. The younger you are, on average, the more likely you are to shop sooner and not procrastinate. I think a lot of folks would think it the other way around, but this study from Compare Cards finding out differently. Now, this isn't to say people don't mind to open their wallets later in the season. According to the data in this study, 39% of credit card holders in the U.S. said they will start shopping after Thanksgiving, with many starting in the middle of December. Can't get any more last minute than that. Lastly, the more income or wealth a person has, the more likely they are to finish shopping early. There's a wide gap between the groups north and south of that $100,000 per year mark, which makes sense given that big ticket items may be held off to the last minute for people who make less as they're trying to save aggressively for those items. We also have to account for credit card approvals with those who are not making cash purchases outright. Now, what does this mean for retailers, particularly brick and mortar retailers? All of the study data basically backs up the assertion that retailers need to have presentable sales floors after Labor Day all the way until mid-January, where some retailers cut payroll in the relatively slow month of September. This is actually where potentially they need to ramp up hours in getting prepared. We've seen and talked at length about prominent retailers like Kohl's and Target, JCPenney as well, hiring early to train up for the holidays, hiring as early as September, in fact. It's not just a matter of getting new seasonal merchandise and all the hot gift ideas for a particular year out to the sales floor and making the stores clean and zoned, but also training the temporary associates is crucial to work with these new inventory systems that are being rolled out on a regular basis, but also to work with the in-store tools that are at their disposal to enable smooth site-to-store transactions in particular. Now, most retailers are certainly looking forward to a top-line boost this holiday season as a result of some of these forecasts and some of the macro factors that Leighton and I have talked about. The ones that are taking it more seriously should not be worried too much about the short-term bottom line, but potentially rather the impression that they're making on all their customers. After all, the holiday season, not a bad time to win over customers and charge up that loyalty. The ones that shop early, on time or late, doesn't matter. The level of experience for the customer is ultimately what will help decide where loyalty lies next year, especially early next year. And we see this a lot as consumers begin to tail back spending on into January and February. Can you win those sales from those consumers because of what you've done in the holiday season? We move on to our last story, and I have to be honest with you, Trent, this has been one of my favorite podcasts to cover. The reason being is we have an earnings story. We're talking about holiday sales, which is always fun, talking about over a trillion dollars in retail sales, potentially. And then now we move into lawsuits, something I actually have an interest in besides real estate. And by the way, I do have to apologize to our listeners out there. Trent and I are both suffering from allergies, so if you can notice that on this podcast, we do apologize, but tis the season, as they say. As 
for this last story. We move on with a battle between Visa and MasterCard and an agreement with merchants, or lack thereof, we shall say, as we will find out later in the podcast, that not all retailers are on board with this particular agreement. It may not seem like a lot, considering we have just got done talking about over a trillion dollar holiday season potentially, but Visa and MasterCard have reached a final $6.2 billion settlement with a consortium of retailers that amounts to around 12 million retailers in the United States. The original lawsuit is actually over 12 years old, almost 13 years old now, and centers around the idea that swipe fees from these credit card companies and banks were too high and that the retailer optionality was too limited, basically saying that whatever fees they were assessing were the fees they were assessing. There was no wiggle room. There was no negotiation between the retailer and Visa and MasterCard, making it harder for merchants to accept different forms of payment as well. So they've been hamstrung over the years, and they've been complaining about it time after time after time. Big retailers, medium-sized retailers, and massive retailers alike have had problems with these payment processing systems. Negotiations have been going back and forth for years, with an eventual even larger settlement having gotten thrown out in June of 2016. So just over two years ago, they found a settlement. They found a room to compromise, and yet the three-judge panel actually ended up throwing it out, saying that the deal was basically a payment, not a true settlement, because they did not agree on all of the terms where things could be actually changed for the better for the future for the retailers in particular. They also cited the level of unfairness in this particular settlement in 2016 for the smaller retailers that would be largely left out of that multi-billion dollar proceed. After the deal went south, the judges opted against it. The 8,000, roughly 8,000 retailers ended up opting out of future settlement talks with Visa and MasterCard, and this reduced the settlement amount to around $5.3 billion, which of course ended up getting increased around $900 million to this latest settlement. And that is why we are talking about this story. This latest settlement between Visa and MasterCard is honestly going to be one of the biggest ones that we have seen here on this podcast. Both have been criticized by merchants, again, over the years for the amount that they have to pay to Visa and MasterCard, which a percentage of the transaction volume has not been adjustable. It's often been something that we've wondered about as monster retailers like Target, Walmart, and even Costco have been unable to use their leverage to strike deals despite the volume of transactions that they process on a day-to-day basis. Since most people do use a debit credit card now at physical retailers, retailers of all sizes have really had no choice but to accept the terms and conditions that have applied to using a particular platform. That said, Walmart has been able to initiate programs where employees, at least, can have their own type of debit card where their paychecks are automatically deposited so they don't necessarily have to pay swipe fees on those cards, on those systems that they've implemented over the past couple of years. Still, most people don't work at Walmart. Most people that shop at big retail, I know that Walmart employs over 2 million people, but there are a lot more people than that in the United States that shop retail. So we're talking about just a small fraction of their overall business where they can avoid swipe fees. As for this settlement, Trent, it appears as though most of the money has already been handed over. Yeah, this after negotiations spread out the restitution payments so that small retailers wouldn't be left out. According to Reuters, Visa in particular has already paid the largest chunk of the settlement, around $4.1 billion. The funds have been sitting in a court escrow for months. Now it'll be released, ideally, if this were approved by a judge. MasterCard will pay the rest, and they have already set aside the last $900 million they owe. Let's keep in mind, Visa and MasterCard are massively profitable, so this is pretty much just a drop in the bucket long term. Visa has brought in nearly $20 billion in revenues overall for fiscal 2018. Their fourth quarter earnings, by the way, those come out next month on October 24th. Just imagine how much more retailers could profit if they more aggressively got into the payments game here. So what now? Has anything changed as a result of this deal, or will it? Well, first, it's not a done deal, and this is something we want to drive home. The court still has to approve it. A lot of news outlets are acting as though this is a done deal. The court hasn't approved all the deals in this particular sector in the past. So as a result, 
This not a done deal, but with a statement from MasterCard, it seems as though they in particular are hopeful that this is the real ending to the saga. Tim Murphy, who is a general counsel for MasterCard, said, and I quote, After years of thoughtful negotiation, we are pleased to be able to reach this agreement with merchants to provide consumers convenient, reliable, and secure ways to pay, end quote. What is striking about this statement, though, when you break it down, is that they're basically reminding everyone, retailers included, that it's not easy to have a robust payment platform that's relied upon by millions around the world, even though they've taken a hit. MasterCard still probably feels as though they have the upper hand, and we believe, honestly, both MasterCard and Visa do. Additionally, some of the original and largest retailers that first brought claims against Visa and MasterCard, they have opted out of this latest agreement, hoping yet again to use their volume leverage that we cited earlier. As examples, Walmart, Target, and Kroger have all opted out per a lawyer statement, so this settlement does not include them. Kroger, as we know, has had more of a not-so-kind relationship with credit card companies, especially given the fact that the grocery business is typically a smaller margin business, so this isn't surprising. The justification from Patrick Coughlin, a top lawyer representing the plaintiffs, said that the top 1% of merchants make up the top 25% of the commerce in the U.S. and that they in particular never had any intention of being part of the deal. He did voice, by the way, a congratulatory tone for the smaller retailers who won out, hoping potentially that that will extend then to the larger retailers. But this essentially means that by holding out, the settlement for this particular lawsuit will net the remaining retailers way more, at least that's the potential, around $200 million more, which in the end could help the consumer if this delays the inevitable effects of inflation. It seems as though the major retailers are in sort of a stalemate here with Visa and MasterCard. In the meantime, people are still using cash less and less, as we notice people talking about the war on cash, and still not adopting mobile payment wallets as fast as many thought. Five years ago, six years ago, people were talking about how Apple and Samsung and Android, they were all going to have different payment systems and that no one would even need a wallet anymore to carry a credit card because the phone can do everything. And we see that that is absolutely not the case right now in 2018. A study last year conducted by TSYS found that credit and debit card payments are shrinking cash transactions still year over year. Granted, that study was looking at 2016 versus 2017 payments. However, they did see that some are actually reverting to debit cards from credit cards, which was interesting. Trent, I know you and I were talking about that and how that really doesn't make much sense because if you're worried about security risks, you may not want to use the debit card more than the credit card, at least if you have a credit card. Out of all of the types of merchants they looked at in that particular study, what we found interesting was that fast food and coffee shops saw the most cash transaction volume, signaling that MasterCard and Discover were actually going to be maintaining a massive share of the payment market in discount stores, department stores, and supermarkets. And guess what? Guess the three that we just talked about the most on this podcast Walmart, Costco, and Target. Those are all three massive players, and those are all not coffee shops. Those are all not fast food joints. They are all going to be industry powerhouses that require taking Visa and MasterCard. Additionally, as incomes keep rising slowly in the United States, again, 2.8% for that most recent second quarter index, that increases the probability that consumers are going to use more credit cards as a different study found that people who make over $75,000 per year prefer using credit cards over cash. So you look at all of these facts, you take a step back. This should actually play well in the hand of the credit card companies when it's all said and done because no one's really adopting those brand new forms of payment on their mobile. People are using cash less and less. And it's hard to change habits, Trent. So if you have a credit card, if you have a go-to credit card, chances are you're going to keep using that credit card. And I know a lot of people have different credit cards for different cash back advantages. That's still going to stay in place for the majority of people. The human mind loves the habits. So what is interesting too, at the same time, retailers like Walmart are partnering with these very same credit card companies to offer promotions that essentially advertise and motivate consumers to use their more modern services. The services, the new services that they're trying to get out to the general public, like 
For instance, I saw several promotions between American Express and Bank of America when it comes to cutting customers a deal with their first Walmart grocery pickup. So if anything, this is yet another indicator that we might be on the sidelines looking at swipe fee negotiation in perpetuity because to be honest with you, Walmart cannot abandon credit cards. Costco cannot abandon the visa relationship. So long term, I am sure they're going to come to a deal, but this is not something I would see in the next two to three years if I were a betting man. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. We've reached the final segment of the Retail Focus Podcast, a segment we call Looking Ahead, where each late and I select a story that we're keeping an eye on for the next week or month, and we may talk about in the future on the podcast. We begin with Leighton. I'm going to keep my Looking Ahead story very short, but it's going to be very simple as well. There's a couple images that I recently took at a Best Buy that I was going to post on our Instagram. By the way, you can find us at Retail Podcast, just the same as our Twitter account. These pictures were of toys in Best Buy, and I'm not talking just a small end cap of toys. I'm talking about four aisles of toys, and we're talking about Star Wars collectibles. We're talking about Hot Wheels. We're talking about all the conventional toys, small, large, that you would see in a typical Target or a Walmart, this totally took me by surprise because as much as we've been talking about JCPenney expanding their toy selection, even Walmart expanding their toy selection, this holiday season by up to 30% in their physical stores, we have not talked about Best Buy expanding their toy selection to four aisles. And meanwhile, Best Buy was a company we talked about not that long ago They were ending their compact disc selection, so they no longer have music at their stores, yet they have Hot Wheels at their stores. And so I never really expected that from Best Buy. As it relates to my looking ahead, the reason I mentioned Best Buy, the reason I mentioned the pictures I took of their toy aisle, is to say this. A recent study found that toy sales in July and August were down to high single digits. That is not good at all. That is not good at all because everybody analysts included, were saying that the toy industry growth for the retailers that had previously not had much of a position in the toy market was going to stay explosive this year because Toys R Us is bankruptcy. That is not the case. And now projections are saying that September is actually continuing that downward spiral in the high single digit range. That is not good news for the retailers that have been historically out of the toy market. What this does signal, however, is the fact that perhaps there has been a lull in toy sales because people are waiting to shop after Labor Day and more towards the holiday season. So I wouldn't be too pessimistic right now and say that toy sales are permanently gone because Toys R Us physically doesn't exist in the United States anymore. I would say that there is an opportunity to see really strong sales through January. However, If you are a retailer, the one question you have to ask yourself is, do I spend money? Do I allocate capital to a ton more toys right now seeing these numbers? Or do I stay on with the idea that more people are going to need a place, an outlet to buy toys for their son or daughter or for their niece or nephew as gift ideas later on? It's a big risk to take. And it looks as though many retailers are still bullish on this idea that they should expand their allotted space for their toy market share. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, Toys R Us closed down. All these retailers jumped on board carrying more toys. You mentioned Target, JCPenney, and now Best Buy, among all the other retailers that we've talked about. And it seems as though the market is more fractured than ever, and potentially already saturated. I think if you're a retailer looking to get on the game, it might be uh, too far past you at this point. Well, my looking ahead story, I'm continuing to look towards the youth segment. Leighton talked about toys. I'm looking at youth fashion and more specifically, Asina Retail Group who will report earnings next Monday. One of the things I'm interested to see for Asina Retail, you know, one of their 
brands is Justice. Justice, along with the rest of Kids Fashion, was the only division in the company to show same-store sales that increased in the third quarter, which was their last reported quarter. Yet at the same time, they have closed more Kids Fashion stores by percentage than any other part of their business, including the value fashion that's really been dragging them down in Maurice's and Dress Barn. Last reporting quarter, value fashion was down 9% in terms of comp sales performance, which was far worse than any of the other company divisions. So what I'm looking ahead to is this. Will the company eventually begin to invest or reinvest in kids' fashion now that they're seeing sales numbers grow up? And overall, how will the company perform in this quarter? You know, this quarter, the fourth quarter of last year, they actually saw positive earnings per share on an adjusted basis. Can they do that again this year after they showed negative earnings per share, a loss of eight cents in this last third quarter? So a lot to look for here as far as the Cena Retail Group is concerned. But it's just very interesting to me when they talk about right-sizing their store portfolio that they're basically biting the hand that feeds them. They're biting the hand that's kept the company afloat in terms of kids' fashion as, again, their same store sales going up, but they've cut over 60 stores in that particular division since last year. Well, that'll do it for us here on the Retail Focus Podcast for Leighton. I'm Trent. Once again, check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Retail Podcast, and we'll be back one week from now. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.